I want to tell you a story about refactoring today. This video is going to be one part me complaining about React hooks, one part uh, talking about how React Query is actually a great library and you can get a lot out of it, and mainly me talking about how finding the right place to solve your problem can make your life as a developer so much easier. We're working in a React application here. We're using React Query as a way to do our state management. And to get us started here, you can see we've got a couple of hooks for getting widgets and gadgets. Now these are two types of products, for example, that this fictional company that I'm working for here sells, right? And so right now I'm just hard coding a return for both my widgets and my gadgets hook, but you can see I've got use get gadgets and use get widgets here, and both of them return either the array of widgets or the array of gadgets. And obviously when we're using these hooks, we have a local state of some set of gadgets and widgets that our user has access to. Now our user also needs to be able to create gadgets or widgets. So we've got these two hooks to manage those mutations where we have use post widget and use post gadget. Now for my simple example here, I'm just returning the widget that we get passed in. And you can imagine that what's actually going on here is that we're sending a post request to our server to create this new widget and new gadget. And of course, the saved resource is going to be returned in these hooks. So this brings me to the problem I was trying to solve. I wanted to create a single React hook that would allow me to interact with either my widgets or my gadgets. You can see I have this product type here that is widgets or gadgets. And the idea is that the user maybe is trying to create a new widget or gadget based on some ID that it has, right? If we look at our types here, we can see we just have these IDs. And so if the user puts in an ID that already exists, we want to just fetch that existing one. We probably have it already in our local state because of our get widgets and get gadget hooks. And so we don't need to go to the server for that. However, if that widget or gadget doesn't exist locally, we want to send a post request to the server to actually create it. So essentially then what I'm looking for is some way to wrap up the behavior of all four of my hooks, my get widgets, my get gadgets, my post widget, and my post gadget hook. So what we have here, this use, get, or create product is my first iteration of this hook. Let's walk through what we're doing here and then we'll see why I don't really love this. First, the product that we're trying to either get or create is gonna be stored in our use state here. Then we call our two get collection hooks, one for widgets, one for gadgets. These have probably already been loaded into our local cache because they're used elsewhere in our front end application. So this is just a way to reference that data. Then just in case those collections here don't have the data we're looking for, we need to make calls to our post widget and post gadget hooks here. And of course we need to reference the mutate functions that React Query gives us where we'll actually make the call to the server. We need to reference the data that we'll get back from the server. And we also need our reset functions here. And you'll see why in the next chunk here, which is our use effect. The use effect of course is going to be called anytime new widget or new gadget change. So the data that we're getting back from our call to the server. Now we don't know if we're actually going to need to make a call yet. At this point, we haven't checked our local data. If we do need to call these create widget and create gadget functions, then we'll need to reference new widget and new gadget. And so we have our use effect for that. And first we'll just check to see if there is a new widget. If there is, we can set our state and then reset that mutation hook. And if there is a new gadget, we'll set our state there and reset our create gadget hook. We need to reset these because if the user is calling this hook multiple times on one page, we can't let new widget here always override new gadget. And so by calling reset here, after we've stored off the new widget into our own state, we can tell this mutation hook here to clear its own internal state and new widget will become undefined again. All right, so that's kind of just the setup. Now, of course, our own outer hook here, use get or create product, has to return its own mutation function that is actually the event handler we'll use on our page. This is gonna take our ID, either a widget ID or a gadget ID. If this is a widget ID, we'll check to see, do we have a set of widgets locally? Now remember, this set of widgets locally is our local collection coming from our get widgets hook. We can search to see, do we have the right widget? And if we do, we will set our state to that and then we're done. Now, if it's not a widget, we know it's a gadget. So we'll check to see, do we have gadgets locally? And assuming we do, then we can search inside of them. And if we find it, we'll set it. If neither of those things are true, we cannot find anything local, then we'll go ahead and create our gadget or our widget by sending our post to the server. And so this is where we're finally using those mutation callbacks that we get from our mutation hooks. And then of course, the other thing that our state can return here is our data, which is the product that we find in our local state. So this hook is fairly complex. It's like a combination of other hooks and it might not seem obvious how we use this, but we can see that this is very simple now to use in our application. We have our get product 
and the actual product that we get coming out of that hook. In these buttons, and we'll look at the UI in just a sec, you can see Widget 1 and Gadget 3. These are ones that we'll find locally. Widget 5 and Gadget 5 are ones that we won't find locally. And so when we find those, we'll print their IDs here in this H1. Now, if we load this application up in a browser, we can see what's going on here. We're getting our gadgets and our widgets from the server. These log lines are coming from our collection query hook. And then, of course, when we call to our get or create hook, our use effect happens. But you can see both times the new widget and the new gadget are undefined. So let's see what happens when we hit some of these buttons. If we hit W1, our header updates, but we get no additional logging, which is what we would expect. If we hit G3, the same thing happens. So these are both products that we have in our local state, so we don't have to hit the server for them. If we hit W5, we do get the log posting new widget to server. Our use effect is called when we have a new widget, as you can see right here. Uh, we'll use that to set our local product state, which is where W5 is now showing as our header. And then we also will use our reset to reset that hook. New widget is back to undefined. If I hit G5 here, you can see the same thing happens, posting new gadget to server this time instead of the widget. And our use effect shows that we first get our new gadget, and then we actually call that again after we reset our new gadget because G5 showing as our header here, we now have G5 in our product state instead of just in our mutation hook state. This works, but this is an incredibly complex hook. And I hate that we have to have so many conditions all the way through this. What's very ironic to me here, and I'm going to try and not get into a rant about hooks, but so many of the conditions that we've had to introduce here are because we can't put hooks themselves inside of conditions. So I have to call my collection hooks, my mutation hooks all up front here, and then all through the rest of my logic, I have to check to see, am I working with a widget or am I working with a gadget? Am I working with a widget or am I working with a gadget? All the way through. And we kind of have double the business logic here. This is not the way you write JavaScript outside of hooks, is it? Normally, I would just be able to call to my local state to see if I have widgets. If I do, try and find the one I want. If I do find it, I can just return it. And if I don't, I'll make some call to another function that creates it, right? Which is what's going on down here. And then return the result from that. If it's a gadget instead, I can do the same thing. But basically, then I just have one main conditional. If it's a widget, do this. If it's a gadget, do this. Instead, I have this weird scattering of logic where I get my collections up here, and then I use them down here, and I get my mutation functions up here and then I use them down here and then I create this local state up here and I use it some up here in this use effect and other times I use it down here in this mutation function and then the actual result of it I never really return on its own or from any of these functions but I return from this overall hook. Okay that's enough of a hooks rant for this video and really we're too far into this video now without actually talking about a solution so let's see how I refactored this. The main thing that I did was move the functionality that checks the local caches into my mutation hooks. We've got our get widget, get gadget hooks. Those have not changed at all here. The main change here is in my use post widget hook. Previously, it was basically just these two lines, right? Where we took some new widget and we pretend to post it by doing our console log, but then we actually just return it. Here is the cool part that changes this. I can reference my React query client with this use query client hook. We can then actually directly reach into our cache and look at other data. So here I'm getting query data for the query that uses this widget key, which is my set of widgets. And now I can do exactly the behavior that I just talked about wanting to do. I get my list of widgets, assuming that exists, I can search for that widget. If it exists, I just return it. And if it doesn't exist, I can make a post to my server and then return the new data that I get from there incredibly simple. And we do the same thing here with post gadgets. Now, obviously, this doesn't get rid of all of the complexity in our get or create hook here, but it does clean it up dramatically. As you can see, we no longer reference the data collection hooks. We just reference the data creation hooks, our post widget and post gadget. The only difference now is our mutate is very simple. Really, our mutate is just a way of saying which of these mutate functions do we want to call. And our use state locally is just a way of capturing the state that we get back from our use post widget or use post gadget hooks. Now, I won't say that I love this new version of this hook. It is definitely better than where it was. But what I do love is these new mutation hooks. Specifically, I love two things. First of all, this function that I pass here to the use mutation hook, this function has nothing to do with hooks at all. It's just a normal JavaScript function. This is something that I could pull out of this use post gadget hook. And of course, the same thing is true about this use post widget hook. I could pull these functions out, unit test them, 
wrap them into a overall library that I may be using in other applications um, that maybe aren't React apps, anything that is kind of part of my business domain. Even better than that, they're similar enough that maybe I can come up with a simple abstraction so that I can share the main complexity of searching a local cache or creating it if it doesn't exist and really just have the thinnest possible layer here in these hooks. Of course, if we go back to our application here, we can see that this still works. I've added some additional logging here, but you can see when we hit W1, we now say we're returning an existing widget. Of course, the use effect happens as before because we're setting our local state. We can hit G3 and we get returning an existing widget. If we do W5, we're posting new widget to the server. G5, we're also posting a new widget to the server. So I hope this was kind of an interesting story about how refactoring and how putting the business logic in the right place can make your job much simpler. For me, there are two takeaways from this experience. First of all, as a consumer of frameworks and libraries, if it feels like the way I'm trying to do something isn't the way the framework wants this to be done, then maybe I should look for another way to do it. That's not to say that all frameworks or libraries are opinionated or have good patterns that you can use, but a lot of the big ones, of course, things like React and React Query as well, will have good patterns and best practices that you should follow and definitely try and abide by those as much as possible. The second takeaway is kind of the inverse of that. As someone who works in a team of developers and often has to build even just small small, simple APIs, as simple as a function signature sometimes that other developers will then use. This makes me want to think about how do other people use the code that I write and how can I make it really easy for them to do the right thing? And also, how can I make it very obvious what the right thing for them to do is? Well, this kind of feels like a bit of a rambly one, but I hope you found this useful. Definitely drop a like or a subscribe if you did. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.